Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Jesus' Lord Ministries International in beautiful Pennsylvania. We welcome you for this morning's service. I believe and pray that you're having a good week because how can it not be good with the Word of God on your side? God is for you, not against you. All we have to do is call upon Him. The Bible says, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And in another uh, area of the word it says they'll also be saved so wonderful things happen when we call upon his name jesus 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 we just want to call upon you i'm so thankful to be here and i'm glad that you could join me and we have a interesting great service for you this morning Let's look at something that i never talked about before that'll be fun for me um, and I just hope you're having a great day. I pray that from this moment forward, things begin to get brighter for you. Things begin to look up. Healing begins to come to your body. Blessing begins to flow into your family. Lost ones are coming back for Jesus Christ. We just believe that by faith. Anything's possible for God. The word of God is so valuable to us that we can get inspiration from it. When things look hard or impossible, even in the word, we see that God is still on the throne. Nothing is above him. He still reigns and rules over all things. The devil might be the prince of the air, but we still serve a God that's way above him. He gets the final say. I'm thankful for that. I just encourage you to surrender all of your grief and anxiety and doubt and worry. Just hand that right over to Jesus. Let him take care of it, for he has surely died for your sins. Let's just pray and uh, we'll get going here. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. We just ask for your blessing. Let me be a vessel that could be profitable for you today, Lord. Let your word flow. Let it do what you said it would do. It produces results, God. Thankful for your word, God. What a wonderful word. God, you've given us everything we need. We're grateful for it. Allow us to be, our lives to be changed and transformed and shaped and molded to become more like you. We just thank you, Jesus. Bless everyone that's tuning in today, God, and present here, Lord. We thank you. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go right into Judges chapter 13. Oh, we could start at verse 1, I guess. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren. She could have no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or any strong drink and not eat anything that's unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite. To God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Amen. This is the promise. I like. I just realized that the the angel of the Lord comes to these women that are barren, and they bring forth mighty men of God and women of God. I believe we saw that also with uh, um, John the Baptist, his mom Elizabeth. She was barren too. And God brought her a child. He brought John the Baptist. You know, it's interesting. I believe these women were praying that God would bring forth a child from their womb. And even in the natural, it's not possible, but God could care less about the natural. He created it. He, he has rule over it. And he's able to bring a child forth through their loins. But you see the careful instructions here. We have that he, you know, not to have alcohol. I mean, a lot of people try to argue and say drinking alcohol is great, but any time God was bringing a mighty man of God onto the earth, he said that no alcohol should touch his lips. So apparently God does see that as a form of defilement in a measure. We got, I mean, it's something to consider. Um, let's just look here now. Uh, it's interesting here. The angel gives her destructions. For behold, you shall bear him a son. You shall have a son. No razor will come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. That that Nazarite was was his identity. He was born into a certain, and then it was his identity to not have a razor come upon his head. 
It was a special called group that were just dedicated to the Lord. Something key here to think about as we go forth here, because we're going to talk a little bit about identity. And I believe that this is his identity. But let's look at Judges 13, 24. That same woman bore the son then and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. Oh, there we go. Lord bless me. I would, I would confess that if I were you. I would say, Lord bless me. Thank you, Jesus. And the spirit of the Lord, verse 25, began to move at him at different times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Ashtawal. So God, the Holy Spirit, began to move upon Samson mightily. Everyone would have known that the Lord was with him. That's a great thing you can think about when it comes to men and women of God. You, you never have to force your fruit on somebody. You can let them come and pick it. And that's similar to this where everybody knew that the anointing of God rested upon Samson. Judges 14, 5. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnah. And came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came against him. And the Spirit of the Lord again came upon him mightily, and he ripped it as he would a small goat. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. It's powerful when the Lord is upon an individual, what can come of it, what can happen, the great miracles and things that God will do. And I know in Daniel, I believe 11.32, it says, Those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Amen. That's all of us. Anybody who calls upon his name, anybody who knows the Lord, will be strong and they will do exploits. So you see the identity that God has given Samson here. As he continues along, God is with him. God is for him. Things are going well. Let's look at Judges 15, verse 14. Now, Samson has done many things in these few chapters where God is with him. He, he, he's, God's actually using him to bring judgment against the Philistines because the Philistines now were over Judah and the children of Israel. So now, you know, when God surrenders a nation or a people to be judged, then he also judges the ones that he, he put over them to judge them. It's kind of interesting how that goes around. Kind of like the 400 years of slavery, children of Israel. But then it says, when that time, that season came to a pass, God judged Egypt too. So nobody gets off the hook here, no matter where you're from. Whether good or bad, judgment still rests upon us all. But let's look at uh, Judges 15 here. This is one of the great things Samson did, verse 14. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and the, the ropes that were on his arms became like flax and burned with fire. And his bonds broke free and loosed from his hands. He found a jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it and samson said with the jawbone of a donkey heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of a donkey i have slain a thousand men god is doing great things through samson samson now is is is, is coming against these philistines that have been over his brothers and sisters and over their families they've they've been they've been under this group and god has raised samson up to bring deliverance for them. Let's look at Judges 16, verse 5. And the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and see. This was Delilah. This was Samson's girl. Entice him and see where in his great strength lie, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and that we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So we see now with Delilah, because Samson is, 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 is mingling and marrying and, and, and engaging with the, these women that are outside his group. Even his parents said, can't you find a woman amongst our own brethren? Must you go and, and, and do this? But in a way, God was using this as well to, to bring judgment to the Philistines. But So now Delilah, his current girl, is being asked to, to reveal Samson's secret 
which in that secret really is his identity. As we get down to here, like we talked about early on, remember what the angel of the Lord told Samson's mom before he was even born. And his parents gave him those destructions and, and, and uh, instructions. And he knew what he needed to do and what was required of him. But let's see here. Judges 16, verse 15. And she said to him, how can you say you love me when thy heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and has not told me wherein thy great strength lie. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was vexed unto death. Then he told her all his heart and said unto her, there has not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven. Then my strength will go away, and I will become weak like any other man. Oh, my goodness. Samson made a mistake here. He, he revealed what would cause his fall. The razor coming upon his head. Remember, the angel of the Lord said that can never happen. Because why? God had him, given him an identity. And this is important for you and I today, that our identity is in Christ, that we stand with Christ. Not compromising our identity. Identity of our nation is under attack right now. They want to re people want to rebrand the identity of 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 what God has created to be good. Created man and woman. He put him in marriage, and he said these things are good. But do you see the enemy comes against what God has created? He comes against marriage. He comes against the man. He comes against the family. You could see it's a planned strategy to take down the family, to take down what? Our identity. How important our identity is. And we could see in Samson's life here, when he began to compromise his identity, it doesn't go well for him. Let's look at chapter 16, verse 19. Now, this is after he told her what could cause him to fall if he surrendered his identity. And she made him sleep upon his, her knees. Then she called for a man, and they caused him. She caused the men to shave off seven locks of his head. She began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. When Samson compromised his identity in, in God, the blessing of God, all that God was doing, left him. And in the Bible, if you keep reading that, it says he didn't even know his powers were lost. He didn't even realize. God had departed from him until they came. They ended up plucking out his eyes and they take Samson hostage. His powers are lost. Why? He he compromised his identity. He fell into pressure. He, he, he gave up what God had given him, knowing that that was never to be done, but, but he, he under pressure, under constant pressure. And it's kind of like the world today. The world is constantly pressuring people to what? Give up their their identity in Christ. Our young people are pressured daily, every day, to give up what God has given them, what God has, has blessed them. Now, we do know that Samson, God restores him in the end, and he does use Samson to bring great judgment upon the Philistines. And, but there was a season of suffering for sure for Samson. As he was blind, they plucked out his eyes, and they, they, they kept him as a slave but identity in, in in the christian in the believer today is, is is our everything you know many people in the world they think their identity is their job or you know where they live or the different things that they do but that's really the world's identity our identity is in jesus christ it's kind of like the obituary when you read that uh if you read obituaries of people it lists all these things they love to do this they love to do that they enjoyed this. They enjoyed that. But really, it was all a lot of temporal things, a lot of earthly things that in one aspect are okay, but it's not really our identity. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, how Paul even addresses himself. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. You see, Paul was bold in his identity. He knew who he was in Jesus. And he starts out his letter to timothy that way paul an apostle of jesus christ we need to wake up in the morning like that and look in the mirror and say whatever your name is a child of the most high god remember we're sons and daughters remember jesus said you're no we're no longer the servant 
because the 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 master doesn't uh doesn't give the secrets to the servant but only the sons and daughters as he does to us he gives us the takes us into the innermost court as children of the most high god that boldness that paul had we need in our walk to be strong in our identity in Christ. It's the most important thing we have. All other things are secondary. What kind of things will last when we go into the next world? A lot of the temporal stuff just burns up. It won't even carry on into eternity. But our identity in Christ will. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is Paul again speaking. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. How many of us are ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, it makes you wonder. With as many people that acknowledge Christianity as their faith, you wouldn't know it by driving around America. You wouldn't really see it because many of us are scared to stand up. Many of us are, are embarrassed to make that our identity. But, but for me, and I believe for you, that that's not something that we're going to compromise on. We're not ashamed. It's Jesus who died, was buried and raised that we could be buried and raised in galatians paul again talking you see he has to he gives a kind of a, a sharp rebuke to the galatian church what was the problem they were quickly giving up their identity kind of like samson look what it says here galatians chapter 1 verse 6 now this is the beginning of the letter I mean, he's two, two, two or three thoughts into it, and this is what he says. Oh, he, he gives his introduction, and then the first thing he says to him, I marvel that you are so soon turning away from him who have called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And you see that, that many were, were giving up their identity in Christ that they already had had, and Paul had to tell them, I marvel. How could you just so quickly trade that in? You know, that reminds me of even America sometimes. I think like uh, we've traded in our birthright for, for, for a little bit of glory, for a little, for a, uh, a bowl of soup. It just reminds me sometimes. And I believe God's going to do have his way in our nation. But, but many times it seems like that, you know, for the, for the short term wealth and riches, we've, We've handed over all that everyone's paid, you know, laid down their life for. All those that have come before us. Many young people, I don't think they really have any, uh, you know, admiration for our nation at all. They, they they don't have like that, like it maybe it was years ago where the the flag of America meant something to to people. You know, they would they would fly it high and and honor it and 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 believe that this is a great nation created under God. I don't know if we have that today as much. I believe God's raising up a remnant, but just generally speaking, the pride of our nation is kind of dissolved, unfortunately. But what is that? It's identity. We've given up our identity for what? A bowl of soup, for a short-term pleasure, for a little bit of riches. We've sold out our identity. Now look at Hebrews, what it talks about Moses. It says in Hebrews eleven twenty four. Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction and persecution with the people of God than to just enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Wow, now you can see why God chose Moses. Look at the character that he had. He sat in the royal palace. He sat with the king and queen of Egypt. He was an adopted child of theirs. But when he realized who he really was in God, he gave up those worldly things. And it's powerful how, how it says that. He gave up that temporary pleasure. You see, that's what traps so many people. The Bible says sin is pleasurable only for a season. And then it comes to an end. And we see that here, that Moses had wisdom to know that it'd be better for me to stick with God and, and stand with my identity in Christ then just enjoy these pleasures of sin for a season. I know down at the, the ark, you know, the, the, the exhibit that they have, you can walk through there. And I, I saw that they, they have a, a, short, a small exhibit of, of what it looked like of, of, the, of the culture when he was building the ark. Noah was building the ark. 
and they have just a little scene of just people dancing and drunk and and who knows it's probably way worse than that what was going on but you get the picture that you could see that men and women have traded their eternal salvation for for a little bit of pleasure for a little bit of sin for a little bit of pride it it is now cost them their eternity they handed over what god would have gladly given them like he has for me and, and you and all who call upon his name salvation redemption reconciliation god has given us these things but it's our decision whether we take it or not and for me i, I would rather have christ than just a short few years of pleasure and sin that's something to think about how, how encouraging the word is to remind us that everything's in a season everything's in a season we can't hold on to anything in this life too too closely because it could be here today, gone tomorrow, but Christ will never leave us. The Bible says he'll never forsake us. He'll never depart. And that's why he's our number one in front. He, he, we are, our identity is in him. The one thing that cannot fail in this life is Christ. The one thing that can never depart from us is Christ. When we cling to him, when we call upon him, the identity that he has given us as I'm a child of God. And it goes much deeper than that, too. Our identity in Christ is even that we are healed. We are healed as believers. Why? Because it's our identity. By his stripes you were healed. For this purpose the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. You see, these are these scriptures that describe our identity as being even healed. Wonderful things God has given and done for us. We need to be thankful for what God has done. He's offered so much to whosoever. I can just even think that when Jesus in the last days, it says he rose up and stood and cried out and said, whoever, whoever is hungry and thirsty, come and drink from the wells of living water. He said there's, there's that type of statement many times, different ways. But he cried out in a desperate attempt to draw men unto him. Whosoever is hungry, come. Whosoever. I love how God has made no exceptions or exemptions to whoever will come upon him from all corners of the earth, even today. Right now, every tribe, every nation, every color, every race, Whoever calls upon his name shall be saved, shall be delivered, shall be healed, shall be made whole. And America, and, and, and I just can kind of think that we've lost our identity. We pushed God out. And in, a, in a one generation, we now have seen what can happen when, we, when, we do, when God is no longer in charge, when we no longer allow Christ to be first, we can see just what can happen in one generation. It's funny to me, my, my grandparents or those come, my great grandma long, she's long gone, but it's funny when they say, oh, you know, how bad it was then, they would say. Imagine if they were alive today because they thought things were troublesome then. I know just in my hometown, Many, many, many years ago, an adult bookstore wanted to open up, and the whole town was in uproar about it. They had big council meetings in the borough and all these things to, to try to prevent that, that bookstore, the adult bookstore, from coming. And look how people would stand up and fight and, and, and defend. We don't want that in our town. And they would, why? Because their identity was pure. It was more Christ-centered. Now, today, no one would probably care. But what is it? It's, it's the identity, the identity of Christ Jesus that, that we, we must stand for. And, and it has to be our number one. I want people to know I'm a Christian. I want people to say, what, what's, what's different about you? Why are you like the way you are? It's because of Christ, because of Jesus. How are you able to be free from addiction? How are you able to, 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 to give us, to, how are you able to co overcome sin? It's because Jesus has given us power. He's given us stability. It doesn't mean we don't have to fight. Remember, it says that it says uh, resist the devil and he'll flee, meaning there's always these times of resisting. So don't get me wrong. I didn't, I'm not saying things are easy. I have not found things to be easy for myself, but I found that if I call upon Christ, 
I always have the victory. It may take some fighting. It may take some battling. But I will overcome if I hold on to him. And that's important to know that there are times of, we do have to understand there is times of resisting. Temptation comes to every man. These types of things will always be. And for everyone, it might be different. It, you can't pick on one man's sin. Every man has something that God would love to work on a little more. You know, one man may suffer from this, but another man or woman may suffer from this. It, it, we all have that thing that the enemy is trying to attack us with. But in Christ, we're going to be able to overcome. Colossians 1.13 says, this is wonderful, that Jesus has delivered us from the power of darkness, translating us into the kingdom of his dear son. Oh, how thankful I am for that. We are translated out of here, baby. This is it. We're here, but we're not here. We're in this world, but we're not of it. We are seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. And I'm glad that God has delivered us from that power, meaning that Satan no longer has a hold on us. Those in this world without Christ are bound, whether they know it or not. Many probably don't know. Many probably don't know. I heard someone mention a song recently. It was by some artist where he talks about where he's drinking and smoking cigarettes and depressed and he just can't see any reason to even live. And I can see that that man has not yet tasted of the things of God. Taste and see the goodness of God, because here it says we've been delivered. But someone that's not delivered won't know that yet. They don't, won't understand the freedom that Christ brings, that Christ offers. In Colossians, keep continuing in Colossians a little in chapter 3, it says, if you being risen with Christ, do you see that when Christ died, we who chose to die with him, we died with him. And when Christ rose, we rose. And when Christ was baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, we now partake in that same baptism that Jesus had. What an amazing thing that Christ has given us everything that he had and, and is today. He, he gives to us who, who, who ask him. I love how Jesus talked about, well, well, how can, uh, you know, a father will never give a son a stone instead of a piece of bread. Jesus was showing the character of the father that if we ask, God will give freely give us all things that are good, things that are pleasant for us, that are according to his will for our life. He'll give it to us. We will we'll not hold back anything, Jesus said. It's in line with his will. When we ask with the right desires and when our heart is right, God will give us anything. He, he holds nothing back. He's already given us everything through Christ and he continues to bless us. It says, seek those things which are above where Christ is on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of earth. You see, Jesus is many times and through Paul speaking too that our identity, focus on your identity in Christ. Not about how much money you have or don't have or not how big this is or that isn't or not, you know, what job you work or don't work. If you're if you're not sure about that, just go to a retirement home or somewhere in a nursing home. You see people, they might have had millions of dollars. They may have in a natural done all these things, but now you see that their life is coming quickly to a close and only the things for Christ will remain. You know, our lives are tried by fire. And I think about that many times, and I've realized to God, I thought, God, not much of what I've done is just will, ha, means nothing. Much of what I have done in my life will just burn up. But God, I just pray that many things will remain, that many things will be found to be like gold and silver, not just wood, hay, and stubble. But it's an eternal mindset. We should have an eternal mindset. Don't be so caught up on the affairs of today but focused on the kingdom, kingdom things, eternal things. And, and Paul had the revelation here. He said, set your affection on things above. Our priority should be in our, our identity and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything else comes after that. If our, our, our relationship with Christ is strong, everything else will take care of itself. Jesus said, don't even worry about tomorrow. Doesn't the bird fall to the ground and God knows about it and you know, not one uh, 
all the hairs of your head are numbered and all these things that God just, he, he wanted us to be comfortable to know that we don't have to worry about things. Why would we worry? Our Father in heaven is above all things if we can just keep our eyes on him. We are distracted many times, but Paul said, look what he says here. He continues on and says, for you are dead. Your life is hidden in Christ in God. Powerful revelations that Paul helped us with. For we are dead. We are dead. And we die daily. Awaiting for a hope of a better tomorrow. And we can have a good today too. But I'll tell you, we can't hold too close to it. Because this world is full of turmoil. It's full of sorrow. It's full of sadness. It's full of loss. But in Jesus, all things remain. Nothing that from Christ will fall or fail. In Galatians, he says again, you see the, the kind of a, the trend here. He was encouraging all the churches that he started. It's just amazing that the, the life of Paul, what he was able to accomplish. And when, when Paul says that he, he buffeted his body, he really went hard for Jesus, you could say. In modern day slang, you could say Paul went hard for Jesus. The amount of things that he did to see the church of Christ go forward. And he says in Col um, I'm sorry, Galatians, you are, are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as been baptized into Christ have now put on Christ. You see that identity of Christ? Don't let the world decide who you are. Don't let people decide who you are. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and let your identity be in Christ if somebody asks you, tell me about yourself, what's the first thing you would say? First thing I would say, I would tell them about Jesus. I would say, well, there's not much to say about myself, but I could tell you about the one who saved me. I could tell you about the one who delivered me. I could tell you about the one who healed me. All the other stuff's kind of secondary. Well, yeah, I do have a job. I am, I am involved in these other things, but that's not really my identity. Those are just these earthly things that I do. My real identity is Jesus. My real identity is Christ. Everything else is secondary. I love having conversations with strong believers because all we do is talk about Jesus. Because everything else, honestly, it's hard for me to get too involved. I mean, I could have some conversation about some things, but for the most part, I just want to hear about Jesus. We're baptized into Christ. We've put on Christ. We've put on Jesus and one of the things with this is that we have to see ourselves the way God sees us. We need to look in the mirror, wake up every day knowing that we are children of God, that we are redeemed, we're bought by the blood. The Bible even says, this is no longer I that live, but Christ in me. What a great revelation to allow. And we should all yearn for that, Lord, uh, live in me greater. There's always more we could surrender. There's always more we could be obedient to. There's always a greater level that Christ can form in us as we put him on, as Paul said. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers, stand steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and you know that your labor is not in vain. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you, Jesus, that you've given us the strength. Remember, it's not by our own power. Remember, the Bible says not by power or might, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Everything comes from the Spirit of the Lord. He's the one that quickens us. He's the one that heals us. He's the one that brings deliverance to us. He does all these things. We are only vessels. We are just as the dirt. But through Christ, nothing's impossible. And through his spirit, all things are made new. All oh, that pe more people would understand and, and step into to the wonderful love of Christ, the, the delivering power of Jesus, the, the greatness of our God. Let's look at one more scripture here. We'll, we'll, we'll begin to wrap up with this. In Romans 6, verse 6, it says this. Paul says again, Knowing this, now this is important, that our old man is crucified with Christ. Our old man. Remember, we are not who we were before. I know I'm not. Am I a work in progress? Absolutely. 
Sometimes they say the closer you get to Jesus, the brighter the light gets on you. That's, that's happened to me already. The Lord has revealed sin in my life I didn't even know I had. That As that light gets brighter, you're very much aware of it. Let me tell you that. Let that body of sin might be destroyed. And we should not serve sin any longer. I love that, how we are crucified with Christ. That, it, it's the most wonderful feeling to just be totally surrendered and helpless before Christ. I think that's just the greatest thing ever, to just throw yourself like a dead man before him, and then he raises you back up. Greater than you ever were. The, the Christ in me is greater than anything I could have ever been on my own. That's the beauty of Christ living in us, the Holy Spirit. Living in us, it's better than anything I could have ever done on my own. Me with Jesus is better than any version of me without him that I could have ever even tried to create. Or the world. The world could not have created it. Remember, everything's temporary outside Jesus. You could have a little money for a season. You could have fame or, or this or that or whatever it is, but it's all temporary. You could see how celebrities and people like that, how they become bankrupt as time comes to an end. Because the thing about the devil is he will elevate people, but then he discards them. The devil uses people at high places and gives them anything they want, but it always costs them. And when he's done with them, he discards them, but not our God. We go from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. God never discards us. He loves us as his own child. <coughs> he says, I prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not have told you. That's what Jesus said. We have confidence that when we leave this earth, at whatever time it is, God takes us into a new place that he's already prepared for us. How much better than that could it really be? I think that's about as good as it gets. God has prepared a place for us, leaving this old earth, leaving these old bodies that go back into the ground, and he takes us up to a place that he's prepared for us. We are crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but him that lives in me. In verse 7 of Romans, he goes on to say, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we will also live in him. You see, it's in Christ that we live and breathe and move. It's in Jesus. But that, that relationship comes as we, as we open ourselves up for it as we yearn for it, as we surrender to God. You know, the great prayer of John the Baptist, he said, Lord, less of me, but more of you. How many times do we pray that? And, and we should constantly have that mindset, Lord, less of me, more of you. Some of the great evangelists and preachers that have gone before us had that lifestyle, the lifestyle of Lord, less of me, more of you. And when we allow the identity of Christ and not be ashamed, like Paul said, I am not ashamed. For him to say that, it tells me that there were people even in his day that were ashamed because of the persecution of the Jews at the time. Remember, when Jesus came, he really turned things upside down. It didn't go over real well. He came and just wrecked everything in a sense, although nothing, you know, nothing really uh, was destroyed. But the new covenant, they weren't ready for it. And they, they killed him for it. But Paul said these are things that we should not be ashamed from. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. I once was lame, but now I walk. Remember what the, what the people said? They said, I once was blind. They questioned that blind man that Jesus healed. And the, the, the thing that the blind man said, he said, whether that man be a sinner or not, I don't know. I just met him. I don't know who he is. But he said, I was blind, and now I see. It's a powerful part of Scripture, that blind Bartimaeus, I believe. Blind from birth. He said, I don't know. He, he said, you guys can do what you want and say what you want about Jesus, but all as I know is I was blind, and now I see. Isn't that powerful, that conversion of him? As Jesus was just doing his miracles, they didn't. not everyone really knew who he was at that time, but that blind man with just all the honesty, I just appreciate that story so much he just said well i i don't know but i can tell you this i was blind but now i see i was lost 
but now I'm saved. I was dying, but now I'm resurrected with Christ. And I pray that you walk in that today, that you receive that today, that whatever you're going through, I, I speak against the plan of the enemy over your life even now. Let everything he tries fail. Let the wheels come off Pharaoh's chariots like God did when, they, when he, uh, the Egyptians chased the children of Israel across that Red Sea. <clears throat> God took the wheels off Pharaoh's chariots. They didn't have to fight them. God did it. And I pray that God is fighting your battles today. Don't be discouraged by the plan of the wicked, but be encouraged that he who is for you has a plan for your life and he will see it and he's faithful to see it through to the end. And I pray that you be blessed today and go out with your identity in Christ, not denying, but standing for him boldly that you, like Paul, are also not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen.